Austin, Texas. Uh, I work for a startup uh, called Dosh. And just to get a quick survey of the room, what, uh, how many of you all, I'm assuming everybody here is currently an Android developer? Yeah? Okay, is anybody not? No, okay, cool, that's good. Uh, and how many of you have, I'm guessing, right, how many of you all know what uh, open source is? Right? Everybody knows, right? Does anybody actively contribute to open source projects? No, okay, so you're in the right place then. So this is good. Um, so yeah, the reason that I ask, uh, there's a lot of uh, barriers to entry, um, but a lot of advantages of contributing to open source beyond just fixing bugs and, and coming up with new issues and everything that goes into it. And it's a really good way to actually uh, get ahead in your career. Um, and for everybody here, for the most part, uh, does Android. Um, so if you, it's a very, uh, there's certain ways of doing things in the platform, right, that you can bring in different pers perspectives in if you have worked in those areas. Uh, and that's a little bit hard to do, right, if you're just day to day doing Android. If you're not doing Android and you're in whatever, whatever world it is that you're in, whether in your like backend services, uh, you know, in the front end, uh, it's the same kind of concept, right? So um, we've all kind of worked with these open source tools, open source technologies. Uh, ironically, right, I don't have specifically Android on here, but these are a lot of the ones that uh, at least maybe that you've heard of, Homebrew, right, Linux, the entire operating system, Docker, NPM. And you might have actually had at some point some thought uh, or some idea as to how to make them better. Right? Or potentially you've run into a bug, uh, or really had, uh, didn't really have a super great idea on how to perform some certain task that maybe you couldn't find in the documentation. And the good thing about that is that because these are open source, you can actually go in and either make these fixes yourselves, right? Uh, actually go through and you know, fix that bug uh, that's been bothering you, uh, file the issue for it, or actually propose and then go through and implement uh, some sort of new feature or enhancement that you uh, felt that actually needed to go into this, uh, into this project, right? So in doing that, you can kind of take control of the kinds of things that you, you work on uh, and get a little bit more of a, a larger perspective outside of the platform that you're working in, right? And really kind of move forward in your career uh, and gain different perspectives and, and get better. So specifically, what I wanted to, uh, to highlight, right, of uh, what we're gonna talk about, uh, we'll probably just, because it's the, the topic, right, just kind of make sure we're on the same page of what is open source. It'll be super quick, uh, it seems like everybody knows. Uh, how specifically it makes you a better developer, right, a better engineer, uh, not just Android or whatever world you come from. Um, how it helps you better understand your tools, uh, develop your network, which is one of the big things that I think we miss, and how you can actually get started. Like I mentioned earlier, and I've talked to a few people right, throughout the conference and, and outside, uh, contributing to open source is actually something that you've maybe at some point thought of, but for some reason uh, not done, uh, sometimes outside of your control. Uh, but uh, other times it's just a little feeling of um, not really knowing where exactly to get started. Right? So, Quick kind of run through. Uh, so something, uh, a lot of the times, uh, it's interesting how the worst place to understand what something is, is by going and actually like Googling the definition. Uh, so this, this isn't one of the like worst examples, but uh, this is kind of what Wikipedia defines it as. All right, software, uh, that's a type of computer software in which source code is released under a license, in which a copyright holder grants users the right to study, change, and distribute the software to anyone and for any purpose. Like I said, that's from Wikipedia. It's not exactly an academic resource, but it's like not a super helpful, maybe. Uh, again, it's not the worst one that I've seen, but the way that I like to mostly kind of explain what it is, is that uh, it's code that's made publicly available for our use and our modification, right? So you kind of have control over what it is that you can, that goes into it. You at least have a say and potentially you can do it uh, outside of like your regular day to day, right? So. Uh, to kind of look into the first uh, topic, uh, so specifically how it makes you a better developer, right? And there's a lot of reasons, but let me, I'll start with kind of a, uh, a situation, right? 
Uh, so in, in Android, uh, we are, we're all, right, kind of uh, Google puts forth uh, certain technologies or you come onto a team that's already using it. Uh, in this case, right, so it could be any architecture pattern, but we're specifically looking at model view, view model, MVVM. And you kind of go through this routine, right, of uh, anytime you get a task, you start to think through the same uh, recipe, right? Do I have my fragment? Do I have my activity? Right, that's, that's the view. Um, do I have uh, the view model for it? And like in previously in, in Jose's talk, uh, you set up, set up the view model, set up the live data, or whatever it is that you have going on in there. And then you set up you know, your model, and that's just kind of a blanket statement, right, in general for just the business logic of what's handling maybe you know, the networking calls, database requests, uh, that could be anything that accesses data, right? And every single time you perform a new task, Right? And you might not realize this, right? but uh, as you kind of start thinking about it right now, you, you kind of go through this same exact process. Right? Uh, do I have the activity for it? Do I have the fragment? No. All right, set it up. That's my view. Uh, I got to set up my view model. If I have the activity fragment, there needs to be uh, that in there. And then I have my model. And as we're going through this, you literally, every single time you get a task, uh, you default to, you tend to not default to, you know, how am I going to do this? You tend to kind of follow the recipe for how it is that we do that, right? So that's the kind of the architecture case. And then for something like the recycler view, right? Uh, depending on the size of team and whatnot that you work on, it might be something that you, you've actually maybe haven't done in a while, but just kind of, uh, you know, empathize take this and empathize with whatever it is that you use kind of in your day-to-day -day that's a typical, oh my gosh, it's a, a boilerplate thing. Um, you know, you set up your, set up your adapter, uh, so you extend the, uh, the recycler view, the view holder, do the whole shebang. Uh, override on create view holder, override on bind view holder, and override get item count. And you do that every single time, right? So as a part of the requirements for what it is that you're doing in your app, you see, all right, I'm probably going to have to create a list. And then your brain automatically goes into autonomous mode, right? And you just immediately create your adapter. You create your view holder. Uh, you bind it. And then you get that account. And there might be some more intricacies in there. But in general, that's the, that's the pattern that you, uh, that you start to kind of go through, right? So you're not thinking about much else uh, in terms of uh, difficulty, right? So it's not, uh, it's not that this isn't hard. Uh, in some cases, right? But uh, the uniformity of architecture, right? That we saw in the case of MVVM, right? And uniformity of just the code that you're writing that's given to us by Android. Uh, it's not making you a better developer, right? And it's something that you, again, you, you kind of do automatically, right? So at some point, like you've gotten really good at your job, right? And, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, but it's something that you, uh, you can kind of get stuck in a rut in. You can kind of get stuck in that. And as you're getting tasks from your, the stakeholders, whether it be from your manager, from your team lead, uh, you're, not, you're really kind of going through the same motions. So you come on, you ramp up to the code base, right? And uh, sometimes it's a little hard. And after weeks, maybe months, uh, you, you feel like you're, you might be like no longer growing, right? And you think back to kind of everything that it is that you're doing off of a checklist. Uh, and this is a lot. There's a lot to do with it, right? And it's not just uh, architecture or what comes out of the SDK, right? But there are some certain things that you might actually uh, never explore about uh, some of the features of, of the programming language they're using, right? In our case, uh, probably Kotlin. Does everybody use Kotlin? Uh, okay, yeah, everybody, for the most part. Uh, some people still use Java, right? They're stuck with that at work. Uh, and just kind of as like uh, an addition to it, right? For example, we tend to compare Kotlin to Java 8. Uh, we're on Java 12, right? Like the Java world is on Java 12. Um, Kotlin compared to four versions ago of Java is, is great, right? Uh, it's a little different now. Uh, still, obviously, you know, I like writing it, but if you're stuck in just the Android world, um, your perspective is a little different, right, on these things. And with Kotlin, definitely not saying uh, I love Kotlin, I use Kotlin, I would use Kotlin over Java pretty much any time. So just kind of put that on the record. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, now all of a sudden Java is better than Kotlin. Um, but at some point, you, you kind of, uh, you've lost, uh, the train is kind of left in some cases, right, with 
the, these different versions of these languages uh, and how you're able to compare all of these different technologies and really have enough information to make sure that you're making the best technology choice for yourself, right? So when you're contributing to these open source projects um, or just looking, right, you get this big, this wider perspective, right? Uh, from if you're looking specifically at uh, the tools that we're using, right? OK, HTTP, Retrofit, Picasso, in just the, the Android context, uh, those aren't apps, right? They're not, they don't work in the same architecture, model of view, model, model. Um, it's a whole different kind of thing to consider, right? Writing SDKs and, and being able to write li libraries for how, how that works, right? If you're somebody who's ever uh, actually worked in web, you know, these concepts of all these architectures that we're coming up with Android, right? They're not, uh, it's a little surprising maybe, right? That it's just now starting to, I guess, be talked about because if you're coming from web world, it's something that you actually might've been working in for quite some time now, right? So the decision seems obvious uh, to be able to actually use it in, uh, in all of your different apps. It's a little technical, okay, cool. So, uh, why can't we actually all just uh, decide, right, one day, uh, I'm working on an Android app, I've been kind of doing these, these similar things uh, all the time, I'm finally comfortable with it. Uh, why can't we actually all of a sudden just say, hey, uh, boss, manager, uh, tech lead, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm sick of, you know, writing the same recycle review uh, over and over and over again, of going through the same motions, uh, today I want to work on the build system, right? I haven't worked on the build system. Today I want to explore uh, XYZ technology, uh, maybe like put up the CI. Um, it's not something that you can just from one day to the next say, hey, I want to be able to like, explore this new technology, uh, explore this new deal. Uh, because the stakeholders in the project that you're working on, uh, when you become kind of the expert in that domain uh, inside of your specific code base and, and what you're doing and good at at work, it's a little hard to sell I want to be able to deliver this two, three, four weeks later, however long it might have taken to, to for you to pick it up, um, because I want to learn a new specific technology, right? Some of us are lucky in the fact that uh, maybe we have uh, some pretty large teams uh, and you're able to actually get a little bit more handholding, get a little bit more uh, time uh, in order to explore all of these different um, kind of new use cases. Uh, but a lot of us, uh, at least in the context of, uh, again, I'm from Austin, uh, a lot of the teams uh, in the States tend to be uh, you know, smaller. So if you take one person out uh, and if you kind of decrease the productivity for one, uh, you, the entire team feels it, uh, the business stakeholders feel it, right? The people that are depending on the app feel it. Uh, so it's a little hard to actually just one day get up and decide, hey, I wanna do this other uh, component right within Android right or within the libraries that we're working on so when you contribute to open source uh, or when you're actually looking at these projects you you know you, you get to actually take a little bit more control of what kind of things that it is you're working on right so and it's not to say that you can just go into any open source project right if you can open up okay HTTP and decide it hey I want I want it to be like this uh, there's kind of rules and uh, like within Scott text um, so it's not that you can just pick a project and decide what it is that you want to do with that. But you can decide what project it is that you work on, right? If you're interested in learning the intricacies of, of the networking stack and how it is that OKHTTP is doing its job, right? If you're interested in, you know, the image loading and, and Picasso or Glide uh, or that new one in Kotlin, I forget what it is, uh, that's pretty neat as well. Um, you can actually decide that that's what it is that you're going to want to be looking at, right? In the next uh, however many weeks it is that you've decided that you want to you want to set the time to do it, right? So being able to take control uh, of the projects that you work on uh, is something that not all of us have the luxury have uh, inside of work, right? And one of the, the neat things about uh, being able to do that uh, is that now that you've actually gone in and decided, like, hey, I want to be able to actually do um, work on these projects, uh, you're working with a whole bunch of different people, right? Uh, and that's new. Um, so in your team, you've been working with uh, just a few engineers, maybe a project manager, a, a tech lead, regular manager. Uh, but now, because of how connected everything is, you're working with people potentially all around the world, right? And the reason that this matters, you might be saying, well, uh, I'm writing code in isolation, right? There's a reason we have GitHub. There's a reason we have um, all these other platforms to be able to just kind of write my code, submit it, 
push it into the code base. Uh, why would I need to care that it's with different people? And in part uh, is because of the code reviews, right? It, the biggest uh, probably piece of interaction that you would have with people uh, in these open source communities uh, will come in the code reviews more than likely. Uh, so I take code reviews for granted. I've always had them uh, in kind of every piece of my career. But has anybody here, does anybody here not actively have any sort of code review process in like within their teams at work? Okay, so that's good because, okay, kind of. Yeah, so it's one of the biggest ways in which you can grow, right? So ideally you're getting uh, maybe somebody who's more senior than you or you can even take, uh, take advice, take different perspective from somebody who's actually more junior. Uh, but it's one of the biggest ways that you can actually allow it to grow, right? To get feedback on your code, see what it is that you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, uh, et cetera. But uh, even then, right, a lot of the times, uh, depending on the team, again, the speed that you need to move at, the code review is just a formality and you just need to kind of put it up there and uh, merge it into uh, to your code base, right? So it's going to depend exactly on, on how it is that your team structures that. Um, but because you're working with all these new uh, people, that means that potentially they're going to focus on different things than what it is that you're used to being uh, kind of drilled on in your code reviews, right? So uh, when I started uh, kind of going through these uh, processes um, outside of work, uh, it was really interesting. Uh, some projects uh, really harped on code style, right? So to me, that wasn't a big deal. Didn't really understand it. Um, and it wasn't something that I had ever, I guess, considered or done before. Um, but having an entire code base look like one person wrote it, um, there are advantages to having that, uh, right? So have everybody on the same page of how your code is going to look. Um, so loosely, it's not, I guess, the biggest deal, but uh, sometimes it helps uh, avoid bugs. It's easier to read. It's more consistent. Um, so this was something that was new to me. Again, a different perspective. Um, that actually, you know, that I had to pick up uh, in some of the cases and some of the projects that I was uh, working in, right? Uh, another thing was the commit messages. People hop on and off to open source projects all the time, right? So um, that's valuable for two reasons. Uh, one is because uh, as a new person on a project, uh, if you're trying to look at the history or trying to look at why something is the way it is, people's commit messages actually really matter for that, right? So. Uh, at some point before, like when I was starting, my commit messages would be like, <laughs> did thing, uh, wouldn't be very specific, wouldn't actually probably be useful to the commit. I just needed the message because uh, Git uh, makes you do that so that I could push it and feel good about myself for now having a commit on, uh, on my project. Right? But uh, the other reason that it matters as well is because when you're actually, even, even if you're not a new person that's going into these projects, when you're actually looking for uh, why it is that something is that way or why something was broken or at what point it broke, uh, it's much easier to have left the breadcrumb of everything that happened uh, in, the, in the project at, up until that point. Uh, so you can identify, kind of tell the story of why it is that the project got to the way that it is, right? And why it is that you can, um, that it got there and the way that you can correct how that was, right? And then the PR frequency, right? I mentioned that uh, some teams, uh, depending on the team, um, it's a bit more of a forma formality. Uh, and some teams uh, get really specific, right? Some projects, they really, really care. Because you're not, you, on, you know, honestly, sometimes you have a bunch of random people uh, committing code into these projects, uh, and they're used in kind of a lot of, you know, thousands of other developers and companies depend on them to work. Uh, the PR, the intricacy in the PR is going to be a little different, right, than, than what it might be in a code base of three people, uh, you know, at a private company that you work at, right? So the size, something that I hadn't considered, right, was the size of the PR, right? In a lot of places, you'll want uh, maybe like one big PR versus, you know, six or seven little ones. Um, but what would happen uh, in a lot of these is, a lot of the maintainers of these open source projects, uh, they're not all like square, right? Where they can, in a lot of cases, do it as part of their jobs. Uh, there are people that are their core contributors outside of their regular day to day. Um, so they've been through a lot of work. Uh, they may be tired. So one massive PR, um, as you're going through, you, you tend to start out and 
read it through it really diligently and really kind of carefully, make sure everything's there. But as you go and get to the bottom, uh, you're kind of, you're pretty tired uh, mentally. Your eyes, you know, they kind of hurt. And once you get to that bottom half, you're like, all right, yeah, this is whatever. This is look good. Um, you know, put it in. So this was interesting to me because at, for at every kind of point, of, you know, up until uh, recently, uh, you know, I had been told, uh, you know, kind of feature branch, little mini PRs, uh, so that they're just kind of easier to go through. Um, and a lot of cases, uh, they'll they'll want that. Uh, in a lot of cases, they'll want uh, just that massive uh, that massive PR. So it's just interesting how it is that you you know different people on the different teams actually do that. And the other one was tests. Uh, again, I mentioned that a lot of people are hopping on and off uh, onto these projects. Um, and in, in these cases, for a lot of these projects no tests will mean, you know, no merging, right? You, you, they won't, it'll be, you know, the feature can look great, but uh, they won't let you merge the, you know, any, any of your code into the project. At some point uh, in, in my career, you know, I hated tests. I didn't really get it. Um, but through kind of these contributions, and one of the things that I picked up was, and, and really appreciated, was being able to come onto a code base uh, and feel comfortable that I was actually writing code that wasn't breaking everything uh, because the tests that people had written before would catch it. Right? So uh, this was something that mattered a lot as well. And it's probably one of the things that uh, most people tend to, not most people, but one of the biggest kind of guilts that people will have of saying, yeah, I care about them. Uh, you know, we think they're important, but we're on timelines. Uh, for whatever reason, like we, we just don't write tests. Right, so uh, you know, all of these kind of new things, right, and working with these people, um, people will kind of, will, they'll, they'll point out things that you don't, uh, that you didn't previously have to consider uh, or care about uh, or think that you didn't, but maybe realize that they were important, right? And this isn't all just for, for you, I guess, to, to make you specifically a, a better developer, but these are all things that you can uh, take back uh, onto your development teams uh, that you currently work on, right? Uh, Ideally, I think the hope for an engineering team is that you, you hire developers uh, with experience or, or maybe with you know, a little bit more junior and grow them um, but, and, and keep them uh, for a long time. Uh, but at some point, uh, you, there tends to be, uh, again, maybe lack of perspective. Uh, they come in and a necessary part right, will be to get into these patterns to understand how it is that the team works and make sure that everybody is moving together. Um, but you need somewhere to get uh, new ways of doing things from, right? So if you're coming in and you're pitching to your team, hey, we don't, uh, we don't consider code style, we don't write tests, uh, our PR uh, processes are lacking, they might have been conversations, again, depending on the team, the context that you come from, they might have been conversations that you have had before that didn't make sense to implement at that time. Uh, but by somebody resurfacing them or just introducing them for the first time, they might be things that you would be able to apply into all of your, uh, into all of your processes now. So uh, again, not just making you a better developer, but kind of helping you move forward in kind of in that leadership way and, and move forward in your career, right? So the other thing uh, that was kind of a surprise to me uh, that I started picking up when I was uh, starting to get into looking at uh, you know, all these open source projects was uh, actually how it makes you uh, better understand you know, the tools that you're using on a day to day, right? Uh, so why is this important? I'll start with the story, right? I w it was pretty kind of early on. Uh, I had just finished uh, university, so you know, I was looking for a job. And I was looking for a job in Android. And one of the companies that I talked to asked me as a part of the interview how, uh, how a specific library in Android performed its like, core function, right? I, you know, the, the point is it, I guess, to, it, it was a relatively old library. So you know, the point is it to, uh, to talk about, about the library or anything. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, you know, I was really more of like a plug and chug kind of guy, right? And I would just put in the library, I heard it did XYZ, uh, I would use it for that thing, and, and I would be happy, right? Uh, at that point, none of the apps that I had worked on were at scale, they were all just for fun, um, didn't matter, right? So they asked me this question, and uh, this was like the first thing that they asked too, and 
essentially that was my answer. Um, was like really, you know, I didn't know. Uh, and I didn't know that I had to care, right? Uh, somebody had taken the time to write this thing for me, uh, for, you know, the greater community. Um, they said it worked, so I was just going to take them at their word for it, right? Uh, and it did work, but the reason that it mattered in this particular case uh, was that it performed the core feature uh, by using reflection, right? So you take the hit at runtime when you're using reflection, uh, and you know that's just not the greatest thing for performance. Uh, you know it affects your app depending on on where it is that you're using um, that core feature. So for these people, it mattered, right? And they had to take that into consideration. Uh, and I wasn't going to know that, and they weren't going to know that if they didn't actually kind of really tend to like dive deep and understand like what it was that they were using uh, and how it was that it would work, right? So. The whole point of that is really isn't to like it's to compartmentalize just this way of thinking, right? Of how is it that you you know take a problem, uh, take uh, you know find a solution, and then kind of break down break down the pieces of that problem uh, and see if that solution works for you, right? And why that matters a little bit is because Android, right, uh, and all these libraries and, and you know these SDKs that we use. They kind of have this idea maybe for how we want to write code, uh, and you have products and, and you have ideas that you want to ship. Uh, and a lot of the times, uh, you can actually go beyond what it is that they thought that you could do, right? And actually, you write code that's beyond what it is that they gave you out of the box, right? And that's really uh, the dream, right, for, for any like, developer of all these libraries is for you to come up with a creative solution, uh, technical solution, for how it is that all of these are working, right? So, with that, like you're able to, again, the point isn't necessarily just understand how it works, but to take that as a symptom of, I care about, I guess, solving these problems and the process that goes into that, right? And in a lot of cases, um, I'm definitely not saying that you just kind of rewrite all the stuff that we're just given for free, right, with all these libraries, but we tend to think about, right, the big ones, right, OKCTP, Dagger, all of those. Uh, a lot of us work with libraries that they're one-offs that we, uh, I guess, didn't really want to implement or it made sense to use as an open source project. I'll give you an example. We use uh, Redux as our architecture at work. Um, there's a million Redux libraries uh, open sourced on GitHub right now. Uh, there's a big one. It depends, I guess, on, on how you're looking at it, but there's a big one called RE Kotlin. Well, we know that now, but kind of earlier on, uh, everybody seemed to have their own little version. Um, Realistically, in this case, I guess for this architecture, um, in my opinion, you know, we didn't need we didn't need the we need, didn't need to use a single person's uh, open source implementation of it, right? Um, we do use it, uh, but knowing the intricacies, you can have intelligent conversations as to why it might not make sense to pull in that extra dependency because it can get deprecated. Uh, it has dependencies, whatever. Um, you can have those conversations, right? And you can at least kind of start to think about how, what is it about this library that we need, uh, and how can we actually potentially get to a certain point where maybe we have enough people that we actually were only using one piece of it, strip it out, and you get rid of a dependency, um, get rid of again, more lines of code within your project, right? And all that, it makes your life better, right? Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, but again, this isn't only really just for you, right? Uh, this is for your team, right? And to be able to kind of uh, grow uh, with everybody on there, but indirectly with that, right? Kind of, it, it does make your life better as well because you don't, uh, you're just, you know, happier uh, with what it is that you're doing, right? The kind of the last piece of uh, specifically uh, the advantages for you, right, is is how it allows you to grow your network, right? Uh, and I think this is, this is a huge miss uh, with a lot of people when they're deciding, um, you know, if they want to start getting into, into looking into this. So some examples. Um, so this is Kotlin, right? I don't know if you can see like with the circle, but there's 343 contributors, right? There's obviously the core contributors. Um, not there's not 343 people you know, actively every single day contributing to it. Some, some people just fix the bug, other people just fix some documentation. Um, but that's a lot of people, potentially, right, that you, uh, that you can kind of work with, right? Um, this is uh, NPM, it's a package manager for Node, right? It's open source as well. Uh, there's 582 contributors to that, right? So that's still a lot, still a lot of people there. 
And uh, who here has heard of Kubernetes? OK, so less people than I would have thought because we're at an Android conference. Um, but so Kubernetes, it's an orchestration system. Um, again, the, uh, the worst place, uh, ironically, to know what that means is, is the website because uh, just like with everything, it, uh, they just assume that you know what it means. So I'm not going to go into what an orchestration system is, but they're open source. They're really popular. Uh, I think they were started by Google. They have 2,335 contributors, right? So again, lots of people uh, that you get to kind of uh, interface with, right? So, you know, it's great. It's whatever. Um, where does this come into play, right? So the average, I don't know if this is true here uh, in Europe, but in the United States, the average amount of time that a developer actually spends at a company is uh, two and a half years, right? So basically nothing, right? If you look at your career in like, you know, a 40 year span uh, or however long, that's, uh, you know, 15 to 20 different companies, right? It's a lot. It's a lot of switches, right? So when you're looking uh, to hire, right, from the perspective of somebody that's hiring, uh, hiring is a huge risk, right? Even nobody's gotten the interview process down correctly. There's gripes with every single one, whether it's the algorithm, whether it's the project. Um, just the fact that you're only spending, uh, you know, one to six, seven hours uh, talking to a candidate, trying to get their skill set for whether you want to work with them for, again, on average, the next two and a half years, hopefully, potentially more. Um, the, it's a huge risk, right? You, ne you never really know for sure that that person, if it's your first time interacting with them uh, in, in that interview process, is going to be a good fit for your company, right? Regardless of how many people talk to them, regardless of, of how it was that they performed in their interview, right? So if you're working with these people, right, uh, one of the biggest reasons that this doesn't, that this is hard, right, is because it's hard to to get a full sense of uh, representation of the person's skill set right, in, in that interview of how it is that they would write code day to day, right, over a long period of time, how it is that they would pick it up. Um, when you're actually working in all these projects, you have a ton of people that you're working with, that you've worked with, you know, on and off, right, uh, for, you know, some period of time that know how it is you work, right. After a certain point, you really just decide, you know, you become one of those people on Twitter or whatever, uh, or you just kind of DM your friend saying like, hey, I want to make a switch. These people already know how you work. They've already seen your code. They've seen your interactions on all the issues. They know you're a nice person, hopefully, or not. And they can tell you, hey, really, you know, you're great, technically. But I know this team, and this is kind of how we work. And, and you just wouldn't be a fit here, right? And that's good for you, and that's good for them, right? So there is a track record of, of your work. It's visible, right? And it just becomes easier to then potentially, if you're at a place where you know, you're unhappy right now, you get to kind of now pick the place that's best for you, right? It becomes the whole, you're interviewing them, they're interviewing you kind of thing, instead of you just waiting for somebody to give you an offer and picking up the offer that, uh, that comes in, right? So uh, it's a huge advantage, uh, and again, a big thing that people miss on uh, in that sense. So now we've kind of gone through, I guess, why it's, why it's useful, right? Um, that you're super pumped, right, to uh, just go and just start looking into all the projects and, and kind of spending all this time uh, doing all the things. Uh, but that's not realistic uh, for some people, right? And that might be some people's barrier to entry. Um, you know, it's hard. Uh, you're coming into, you know, your job is hard. You know, potentially, hopefully, it's challenging, even though, you know, we've talked about kind of getting these patterns in the beginning. Um, but, you know, you come home after work, and you just don't, um, it's hard, you know? You're a little drained. So, um, really, what, you're, you're, what can this, I guess, look like, right? Small things that you can do, right? You don't have to implement complete features, right? Or go super deep to find these like super hard bugs, right? But um, something to get your toe wet, to get you kind of feeling good, feeling like you're kind of, you know, part of the community and, and having conversations and everything, uh, right? Some people, they fix typos in documentation, right? So uh, this is one. Um, this person just, you know, they fixed the typo in, uh, in this open source project, merged it, uh, bam, that's a commit. And usually uh, the same gripes, the same kind of worries that we, we have as developers with our, our documentation and kind of the things that aren't 
just strictly writing code. Uh, that's very true in open source as well, right? Anytime somebody can just give us the documentation and we don't have to write it, anytime they can fix these kind of things, um, that's a big win for us, right? So what else? Uh, the documentation additions. Um, so this person uh, didn't actually know how to uh, how to set up uh, an environment in Gatsby, thought it would be useful, you would do it enough times that uh, it should be in the documentation, put it in there, and um, you know, how did it go? So uh, Gatsby is a web framework. Uh, if you use it at work <coughs> and you're trying to figure out how to do this thing, um, it was something that you were using at work anyways, so uh, to spend the time to actually add that in, it might have been something that you might have done for your own internal documentation as well. Right? Uh, so there's no code, for the most part, no, no, I guess, working code needed there. And then, uh, you know, I mentioned kind of large bug fixes. It's hard to measure exactly how big a bug is going to be or what the work required to fix it is, um, but sometimes you can kind of have a general idea and uh, even super small bug fixes like this, uh, hopefully, you know, they wouldn't take a lot of time, right? But, oh, the, uh, the picture didn't make it, don't know why, but uh, just paint a picture. Um, when we talk about contributing to open source, sometimes you get this, maybe it's a little bit of like an imposter syndrome, right? Pretend there's a commit history there, right? You know, the one that's on GitHub and at the very bottom, there's a lot of green and every single day is filled with green, right? And you're like, well, my, my, uh, my Git charts or whatever it's called, you know, it's never going to look like that. People are, are going to come onto my GitHub profile and they're going to be like, no, this person, this person doesn't commit to open source. They have like, you know, a hundred days of commits versus, you know, 2000 or whatever it is, right? Um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that your, your GitHub, this, is, this isn't a full-time job, right, is kind of the point of it, right? Uh, your, your commit history doesn't have to look like that. It can be, it's for your own benefit, right? So one of the things kind of I like to say is that instead of being an uh, open source right, contributor, right, is to get kind of technical with the terms, right, is that you can be uh, just a participator, right? There's still things that you can do, right, or kind of explore that'll help you grow a little bit, right? Um, oh, right. Here it is, right? You don't need to have a, you don't need to have a graph like that. Is the point, right? You can you can still um, only kind of participate or kind of lurk a little bit. So what that looks like is really you uh, instead of you know coming into work, say you, I mean you really just don't have time. This has to be maybe part of your work. Uh, instead of you know reading blog posts um, or whatever it is that you do to kind of maybe pick up some extra tech stuff, um, you should check out open PRs there, right? Um, that way you can still get a sense of like how people write code that might look a little differently, what kind of stuff it is that people comment on. You can uh, file issues right, and follow the conversations. Um, so you'll learn a lot of stuff there. See a lot of people file bugs for things that you had no idea were problems that even existed. Um, that's another thing that you can do. So it's something that you can, uh, that you can really still take advantage of even if you're not, uh, I guess, actively contributing, right? You're just kind of, you know, lurking, kind of participating in, in the conversation and, and seeing how people uh, go about their day. So uh, real quick, right, uh, one of the biggest obstacles uh, to people uh, was being able to actually say, you know, I, I feel comfortable kind of being vulnerable, exposing myself, saying um, I want to ramp up to a new code base uh, and actually start contributing, right, so something that you can take and do uh, tomorrow potentially. Um, go on to a GitHub profile for a project that you're interested in. Uh, in this case, it's web um, to kind of get a, again, kind of like a, a bigger perspective on, on things that, uh, solutions that maybe work in web that, you know, you could put in uh, Android. Um, they'll have a contributing uh, MD file in there, right? You'll click on that and hopefully uh, you'll see a message like this. Uh, this is Apollo. So if you use GraphQL, uh, any kind of one of those technologies, uh, they're written by Apollo. Um, Hopefully you'll be greeted by something like Apollo. It's a community of developers just like you, striving to create the best tools and libraries around GraphQL. We welcome anyone who wants to contribute, provide constructive feedback, no matter the age or level of experience. If you want to help but don't know where, let us know and we'll find something for you. Right? So super friendly, super welcoming. Um, you can feel a little, you can feel comfortable uh, in that. Um, this is another one by something, uh, something the Gatsby, which is an example that I showed before uh, for web. Um, they go to the extent of saying that you can uh, write uh, blog posts um, and everything for them and they'll help you out. And they even have pair programming sessions 
you know, for their free uh, open source platform, right? If, if you're really struggling to kind of go through and actually get into, into these communities. And the next best thing that you can do is go into their issues, uh, look under labels, um, which is kind of how people uh, essentially label specific tasks in their projects and look for a label uh, similar to these, right? One is help wanted or a good first issue, which we think usually they're the, the core maintainers of the project have identified to those, those to be relatively um, easy. And a lot of these projects have communities on, in this case, uh, something called Spectrum. They'll have Slack communities. If you ever consider like contributing to Kotlin, for example, if you go under their Kotlin Slack, there's a contributing channel. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of support, right? There's more support, I think, than you might realize. So find, find projects, if it's what's something that you're interested in doing, that um, you know, have things like this that make you feel comfortable uh, in order to actually get in there and kind of get started, right? So uh, that's it. I think I'm right at time. So uh, thanks. If you want to have questions, kind of continue the conversation, it's my Twitter handle. Uh, but otherwise, uh, that's it. Thanks.